All right, so um, this week's SEG student chapter, School of Minds student chapter, um, Lunch and Learn, is uh, by Rose Clark, who is uh, at the University of Leicester. Did I say that right? Like, like Leicester? Um, and she's a PhD student. They're working on the uh, Tuvatu uh, alkaline hosted gold and tellurium deposit. She's working with the uh, British Geological Survey and Lion One Metals, the a junior company hoping to start production on that mine soon. And she's an interest in um, both the exploration and genesis of uh, these alkaline type deposits, uh, as well as an interest in sustainability and responsibility within geosciences and mining. And so she's undertaken a number of outreach projects based on that theme. And uh, more recently, alongside um, risk management consultancy uh, firm uh, Satarla, uh, she was looking into the concept of responsible raw materials as well as responsible reserves and how these uh, concepts can be implemented. And so with that, Rose, uh, if you'd like to share your screen and uh, take take it from here. Yes, yeah, so um, thank you. Um, yeah, as has just been said, my, my talk's going to be um, a bit of a, a bit of a mixed bag. Um, so I am going to cover my, my project, um, which is titled Post-Subduction Magnetism and Mineralization, the Tavatu Gold Telluride Deposit in Fiji, um, and, and the science I do, field work photos, um, pretty shiny sample photos, and a bit about the size work I do as well within ESG outreach, and um, some tips and advice I found throughout my PhD that I wish that maybe someone had told me at some point. Um, so... To start, I thought I'd just give a quick introduction to, to myself and to the project. Um, I'm a third year PhD student in the UK, which means I have just over um, a year left. So we have a very different system to the US. So we don't have to take classes. We just have one big project. Um, currently I live in Leicester um, as that's where I do my PhD, but I'm actually from a place called the Black Country, which is right near next to Birmingham. So excuse the accent. Um, and I lived at home to do my undergrad and master's, which is quite unusual, um, but worked behind a bar throughout that time and managed to, to save a lot of money that way. Um, I graduated in 2018 with, a, with an MSI, having done my master's thesis on arc geochemistry, and um, I started my PhD almost straight away. And it's funded by NERC, which is the National Environmental Research Council. Um, and the project kind of came off the back of the, the NERC SOS Minerals program which is a big program that covers the security of supply for ETEC minerals and had four kind of mini programs within it, one which covered cobalt, one which covered rare earths, and one which covered um, tellurium and selenium, which is the, the TEAS project. Um, and the security of supply for these elements is important for the green tech. So uh, tellurium is used in cadmium telluride solar panels, which is some of the cheapest and best performing in hot temperatures. And the TEAS project spans many institutions within the UK, um, but the focus at Leicester on, is on tellurium in alkaline hosted thermal deposits. Um, and as well as my project in, in Fiji, we have sister projects in Romania and in Colorado as well. Um, so I was lucky enough to start my PhD actually with a visit out to Colorado and had a day in Denver and then stayed up in Keystone. Um, where we went to the SCG meeting um, and also held a TEAS workshop in conjunction with the USGS um, and other colleagues from the US as well who work on, on tellurium. Um, and I also managed to go and sneak and, and see some chipmunks, which was really exciting for me because I've never seen one before. Um, but aside from the spectacular views, Colorado um, was the perfect place to host this workshop because of course it is home to Clipple Creek, which is the, the huge gold telluride deposit and one of the first alkaline hosted gold telluride deposits noted, and one of, an, one of um, a host of examples of world-class gold deposits that, that these alkaline hosted um, ones are. So here's Vatakula as well and Porgera. So lots of, of huge examples. Um, but what exactly are the massive alkaline hosted gold telluride deposits? The name is actually a little bit misleading as it doesn't mean just any um, gold deposit hosting alkaline rocks. It's actually a strange subset of low sulfidation epithermal deposits, but some of the characteristics are kind of the opposite to what you might expect in an epithermal. Um, so they can form quite deep and often extend over a kilometer's depth, and they often have limited silica. So if you get none of the silica hard grounds that you might traditionally look for, or extreme alteration halos. And this makes exploration for them actually really difficult. 
um, but very attractive because when you find them, they have incredibly high gold grades and tonnages, um, as well as an abundance in tellurium and other critical or oh, energy critical elements like bismuth and vanadium. Um, they have a connection to alkaline magnetism, hence, hence the name, but no specific geochemical signature, so they're not all sodic or potassic or anything like that. And they all form in post-subduction environments. So the common thread between them is actually the tectonic regime that they form in. Um, and this tectonic regime is shown here in the model that was um, made by the, the late Jeremy Richards. Apologies for taking this straight from the, the paper. I don't usually have to show panel C because it's not applicable for Fiji. Um, so I haven't rosified it. Um, but I wanted to leave it in as it is relevant for Colorado. Um, but essentially what happens is during subduction, you have typical flux melting in the wedge to form your magmas that, that form your volcanic arc. And these magmas store in the MASH zone, and so which stands for melting, assimilation, storage, and homogenization. And here, cumulus apparently form. Um, and these act as a sponge for water and also goodies like gold and tellurium. Later on, for some reason, um, subduction stops, usually um, through collision. And in the history of Colorado, you also see um, delamination as well. And you get this in Romania as most other places. Um, but eventually, you get to, to panel D, um, where extensional melting forms magmas that can re-dissolve the metals from the, the cumulus that you formed or the metasomatized lithospheric mantle. And later, silicate melts are then upgraded enough to form um, high-grade epithermal um, mineralization up here in the later stages of magmatic activity. So, if Fiji doesn't need panel C and, and Colorado and, and Romania fit the model better, why study it? Um, I promise it's not just because it's really, really pretty and nice place to work. Um, although there's no delamination, for 30 million years, actually, Fiji kind of sat along the Vitiaz Trench where we had um, subduction and we then had collision with the Melanesian border plateau, so panel B. And now Fiji sits in between all these spreading ridges here um, and is also experiencing extension itself. Um, so it actually fits the model really, really well. And it's also theoretically, I shouldn't really say this, but easier to study um, as it's much younger than Colorado and Romania. And because it sits on oceanic crust, there's less complication to, to relationships or geochemistry. And it is, of course, also home to world-class gold telluride deposits. So here you can see Fiji and some of the deposits are outlined since so Vatakula, which is, is truly world class. It's been in production since the 1930s. And during the 70s and 80s was the world's only direct producer of tellurium. And we've also got Mount Classy and Tavatu, which in bulk sits it's where I work, and smaller deposits or prospects, so Sambito and Raki Raki. And these all form along what's known as Fiji's mineralized gold belt. Um, where the mineralization occurs in structurally controlled alkaline cold areas, so associated with those alkaline rocks. Um, and there's also an emosi as well, which um, is a big gold copper porphyry, um, and is worth mentioning just because it's of its size. Um, but I work on Tabato, so it's the second largest gold telluride deposit in, um, in Fiji, and is currently owned by, by Lime One Metals, who are going into production. So when I was out there last year, they'd just finished building their own lab, and I'm starting to build the processing facilities as well. Um, it sits in the Navalawa caldera. So here's the caldera and here's Tavatu here. And here, the, the monzonite, which is the intrusive equivalent of these post-subduction calderas, um, intrude um, subduction age volcanic elastic rocks. And the alkaline rocks in the monzonite host the majority of the mineralization and hence have always been considered the source of it. So, the big overarching aim for my, my PhD project is to, to understand this deposit so that we better understand how gold and tellurium get there, um, which is incredibly overwhelming when you say like that, it's a huge, it's a huge task. So this is a bit overwhelming to me. So early on, I had a big project plan to fit into chapters or aims that flowed in a way that made sense to me. Um, and this is great advice for anyone doing a PhD in the sense that we do it in the UK. So we kind of get given a title and four years to run it in. Um, so laying it out like this was really invaluable. And at the end of my, my first year, this was um, my plan. So um, basically it was to follow the journey of mineralization. So going from, from the source, where it came from, um, how it got there, how it reacted when it got there and how we can, can explore for it. 
and then how we can search for it worldwide basically um however contrary to my, my bit of advice saying plan and um, don't ever believe you're going to stick to a plan especially if you are doing a phd and um, because of course even in a normal year science happens and things go wrong and change and evolve and that's great um, and obviously you know life happens but this year we had covid which made this plan look like this now i know restrictions varied everywhere so just for a little bit of context the uk was put into total lockdown in march and then when it came out of lockdown leicester was the first city to have a local lockdown and leicester still actually has some extra restrictions so all this to say i had no access to labs for over six months um, in what was meant to be the most lab intensive part of my phd so I um, had a bit of a panic and then I kind of tried to get on with it. So I rest with some microbiome modeling, brushed it up on my stats. And I even bought a camera and my um, microscope that I managed to kind of smuggle out of the department before um, we shut down and um, made figures and wrote as much of chapters as I could, but it still kind of got to a point where I had nothing to do. So to keep things moving and ensure I can actually try and finish my PhD, um, decided to change some of the chapters so this is actually what my project plan looks like now subject to change of course so the first two points were essentially the same understanding the source which is essentially a regional magmatic study and understanding the deposit so mineralogy parogenesis a stereotypical deposit scale study that you might do at, at master's level or something like that um and then I changed the exploration aspect from vanadium and bearing minerals which had been suggested to me would be interesting um, to biotites, in part because the ones I saw in Fieldsworth were just huge and I just wanted to do something with them. So with a little bit of impromptu research, I changed to um, my plan to using biotites as vectors, which is fairly long haul. So if it doesn't work, there's still a chapter there. And then given the uncertainty surrounding labs, I changed the chapter to a desk-based study um, of a byproduct analysis to basically try and understand if at the end of the day, it's possible to convince um, mining companies or investment companies, you know, just the world, that it is important to, that these deposits can be important from a Tellurium perspective, not just from a gold perspective. And then some conclusions um, at the end. So obviously geologists love sharing fieldwork photos, especially at the moment when we can't leave our homes. So some pretty scenic um, pictures from fieldwork. This one is from um, regional sampling in the Highlands where um, if you don't know much about Fiji, it wasn't that long ago where they um, stopped eating people. And um, my lovely Hilux that while I was out there, I named Hilda, so I got very attached to it. Um, and then this picture here is the daily drive to Devatu. So you can see the caldera rim here, you can see the volcanic plastics in the stream. And my favorite bit of the drive here, um, which in the rain was difficult, but generally very fun. Um, uh, as the focus of my project is on Tavate, the majority of my six weeks um, field season out there was spent logging and sampling core there. Um, and you can see there's definitely worse places in the world to work. It's, it's incredibly, incredibly nice, much better than Leicester. Um, I was also lucky enough to be able to visit various other core sheds. So to go to Batapula and to see other, other um, places, including the, the Fiji um, Mineral Resource Department, so inside core sheds, outside core sheds, in between. Um, one that I had to use a machete, well, I didn't use a machete, but someone had to use a machete to, to gain access to. Um, lots and lots of core. Um, a shameless selfie with the men on site who are incredibly welcoming and friendly, as you can see. Um, and finally, just because we were talking about this before people started filing in, um, at the end of my field work, I had a couple of nights in, a, in the resorts as well. So that's um, the Radisson on Denarau Island. Very nice. Um, so back to the science, back to the rocks. And um, I thought I'd go through some of the, the work I've been doing and um, starting with the source. So my regional magmatic chapter. Um, so most magmatic studies start with detailed petrography. Um, and this slide shows um, slides from Tabato. So these are the post subduction rocks that host mineralization. And you can see even in these unaltered samples, um, there's some um, biotite going to chlorite, there's, that's a huge epidote crystal, there's minor carbonates and, and quartz, and you can see the ground mass, which is, was um, feldspars, is now trashed to um, sericite. 
phenocrysts, they're dominated by biotite, which is the pink up here, and, um, and the pyroxenes, which are the mint. Um, and active R2, actually, there's not all very little amphibole present, suggesting maybe a drier melt than, than perhaps would be expected or a melt enriched in potassium. Um, and it has been suggested that actually remelting of amphibole rich lithologies can separate water from large iron lithophile elements. So you get a melt that, that it's too dry to form amphibole, but still contains lots of potassium, rubidium, barium, etc. And if this was the case, we were melting amphibole, obviously that's totally in line with our mineralization model. Um, but unfortunately, nothing else that I've really seen does fit with that model. So he consists of subduction age samples um, and post-subduction rocks from elsewhere in Fiji. And actually, the mineralogy of them isn't that different. So there's an abundance of, of feldspars, pyroxenes, biotites, and very, very rare amphiboles and minor olivines. So there's, there's an olivine that's been altered to it inside there and some small amphiboles here, but generally they're, they're not really obvious. Um, and this, they also, as well, the, the subduction and post-subduction rocks show very similar geochemistry. So on these graphs here, the purple are post-subduction um, stroshonites, and the oranges are the subduction age rocks. And you can see that actually they show a lot of similar patterns, which are generally consistent with fractionation of, of matrix phases. And um, the most obvious difference between them is actually the divergence um, in the trends in um, potassium, so the post-subduction rocks, um, and much higher in potassium, which shows not only how alkaline, but how potassium these deposits actually are. Using this data, I did some, now watch how I say this, least squares regression modeling um, of the fractionating assemblage, which is modeling which minerals should form in the cumulus during subduction. So the cumulus were on about remelting. And it's interesting because actually form blend doesn't appear to be a fractionating phase at all during subduction instead dominated by um, potassium, uh, potassium, um, pyroxene and biotime, which is the same phenocryst phases that we see during post-subduction. Um, and a drier, more potassium melt has been shown to, to favor this, to favor biotype fractionation over amphibole. Um, so it is plausible, but it really is amphibole cumulus that you're looking for when you're talking about retaining water and, men and the minerals, and metals that we need in the mineralization model. Um, and actually, the idea of this exploitation of cumulus doesn't fit with the observed trace element geochemistry either. So here you can see that the uranium and thorium is really enriched in post-subduction shoshonites. And this would be problematic if it was coming from, from cumulus, just because those ions are too big to neatly fit into the amphibole sponge. Instead, they're far more suggestive of the metasomatized source. And this trough here at niobium and tantalum as well suggests the same or higher degree melting under fluid flux. So in that case, what happens is um, the niobium tantalum signal gets swamped and appears depleted as these fluid mobile elements become relatively enriched. Um, and source enrichment ratios such as barium over lanthanum and rubidium over zirconium are also suggestive of an enriched source. So the model suggests that the system requires subduction to prepare the lithosphere, sure. Um, but whether that's by metasomatism of the mantle or forming of, of amphibole, which accumulates, actually, by my observations, I would actually suggest that it's the former rather than the cumulants. Um, and as a way of trying to back this up and link into mineralization, I took a while recently when I finally got back into labs um, on some method development of atomic fluorescence spectrometry, um, which I could talk about later if anyone's interested to measure the tiny thorium contents of my magmatic rocks. And basically, although not the working hypothesis, an enriched mantle domain beneath Fiji could be a plausible source of mineralization and is difficult to disprove. But if it was the case, high thorium concentrations or contents would be um, observed in all stages of gene activity. However, if thorium is only elevated in the post subduction suites, and actually that is what we see these blue dots up here, um, then a subduction modified source would be suggested. And we were hoping to see fractionation within the subduction age samples, but unfortunately the data just isn't good enough, although it should be. Um, and I'm happy to talk about that later if anyone is interested. Um, so moving on to the second chapter. Um, previously, Tavatu has been described as everything from methermal to porphyry, pseudo-porphyry. Um, there's literature basically calling it all sorts of things. Um, but it's nothing like a stereotypical porphyry, other than the fact that the only fluid inclusion study carried out on the deposit suggests it was formed at temperatures 
above and up to um, 500 degrees C, which is this far too high temperature for a, a traditional epithermal deposit. The gold at Tavatu is generally hosted in these, these thin but continuous and naturally extensive veins, such as the SKL loads, which are made of calcite, feldspar, and quartz, um, with minor biotite, pyrite, and other sulfides. And the gold in them is, is native gold, um, electrum or tellurides. And then some as well is hosted in, in this um, HT zone, which is thicker zones of quartz, pyrite, and magnetite, with really coarse biotites that you can see here. Um, and more abundant sulfide phases too. Um, and this is the bit that, that I kind of got stopped in my tracks in um, during lockdown. Um, but so far I've done, I've done traditional microscopy, so reflected light, and I've done some basic or characterization on the SEM. And I'm finally got to the point where I'm using um, Zeiss Mineralogic, which is a um, really cool program if you're not familiar with it. And it scans my sections automated. So um, each section does two runs, one at a coarse scale doing modal maps like this, which shows relationships really well. So here you can see there's, there's a vein that's lined with quartz and infilled with calcite. And, and it actually produces really quite good um, quantitative data as well um, on modal proportions and things like that. Um, and then we run them again um, at a much finer scale for a bright fire search. And this is what really took a lot of time to, to refine. Um, so basically, you can see here, um, it, even though we, we really mess with the brightness and the contrast, galenas still get mapped, and you can see that some of these galenas are quite big. And we, we're scanning them at such a fine resolution that this can really take a long time. But it also picks up some really teeny tiny tellurides that are just really difficult to spot by eye, so it is worth it. And it also scans as well what it's hosted. And so here you can see um, gold silver tellurides here and here. Here as well, the little bit of, of native gold and electrum are all, all generally hosted in orange, which is pyrite. And um, this gold bit here instead is, is hosted in pyrite as well, but also on the edge of a quartz vein. Um, and you can start to quantify this a little bit better. So you can see there's a little bit of, of gold here, again, associated with the quartz. So you can pick up some relationships really well, and it also gives some pretty neat um, quantitative data as well. Um, and then uh, it's in red because, I mean, who knows if I'll ever get around to it. Um, but I'd also quite like to do some layers of probe work to do a mass balance for, for gold and tellurium. Um, moving on, um, I'm fast and furious this talk, I think, um, is the, the biotite chapter that I'd like to do. Um, so I've already highlighted how biotite is interesting just because it, it seems to form at the expense of amphibole and play a more important role than, than perhaps thought. Um, and it's also present in basically every thin section, including all the magmatic ones. Um, and these, these pictures just show how large they can, these biotypes are at Tabatu and, and how cool they are filling in these veins. Um, and there have been previous efforts to link biotype compositions to mineralizing intrusions and fluids. Um, and these studies often focus on copper porphyry, so casino and kahanga two, two examples. And they've produced variable results. Um, so they can often find systematic differences in geochemistry relevant to the specific study. Um, but it's been difficult to extrapolate across different systems so far. But biotite at a much finer scale is associated with all stages of mineralization or, or raw loads at Tabato. So you can see here there's a little vein that's full of biotite. This is part of the HT zone, which is full of biotite. And another bit of the HT zone, which has very minimal biotite, but it's associated with much yellower bright phases. And here biotite is associated with the salvage. So it really is everywhere. Um, and the hope is that this could provide a method to analyze a system with poor fluid inclusion capacity due to the lack of silica that I mentioned, um, but it obviously has an abundance of biotype. So previous studies um, have used elemental chemistry, halogen contents and phagacities within the biotides to estimate temperature and composition of fluids. So very similar to what a fluid inclusion study would do. Um, and also distinguish between mineralized and barren intrusions, which would be really cool if that could be done across Fiji or, you know, elsewhere to look at alkaline systems. Um, and hopefully this would allow the application of models previously used on porphyry deposits to be used in the context of this hot epithermal. So it's, it's not such a jump, um, you know, it's not like going from a porphyry to like a really low temperature epithermal. Um, and on to my, my final chapter, the byproduct analysis. This is what I've said, it is desk-based. So it's trying to, to answer whether byproducts can be made tangibly attractive. 
So byproducts don't have a code specific definition, but they're generally metals produced incidentally to the main target of mine or mineral processing facility. They may be exotic minerals like these telluride's I keep talking about, or trace elements of the more common minerals, so chlorine rich pyrite, for example, which is definitely found at Batacola. Um, and depends on the mineralogy, they might be extracted by the mine producer um, or operator of mine or plant or recovered from waste and residues from downstream operators, but actually most goes into the waste here. So given this, byproducts aren't included in resource reserve estimations of a deposit. And so the economics of a deposit is determined irrespective of them. And this creates, mar creates marginal economics of recovery for these byproducts. And that's even further complicated as any increase in supply generally results in decreased market price because you have surplus basically. Um, but ironically, this actually makes them, these byproducts, very attractive for new products as an increase in demand um, doesn't increase price. So they're therefore often used in emerging technologies and, and, but have no security of supply and often makes them critical. So my new chapter uses um, life cycle analysis or methodology or thinking, whatever you want to call it, um, which is essentially often called a cradle to grave approach, um, which takes into account um, things going in and things going out at every stage um, to give a full environmental assessment. And it essentially tries to stop greenwashing. So it stops um, a, a process that looks good, say here at extraction, actually having detrimental impacts to the processing or, or production stage down here. So, um, so my study, or my, what I intend to do with this, with this chapter, um, can be viewed from two perspectives. It could be viewed as providing a method to improve the security of supply of tellurium, so it can go into solar panels through broadening the supply base. So basically showing that it is feasible to mine tellurium as a byproduct of gold rather than just copper, which is what is traditionally done. Um, and, and that doesn't have an increase in environmental impacts. It can also be used to show that whilst right now there may be no incentive to consider these byproducts in mine plans or even in ESG frameworks, there is potential to do so in the future. So here the LCA methodology is used to consider whether tellurium extraction by a gold processing could offset some of the negative impacts of gold mining, i.e. If a carbon levy was introduced based on the footprint of a gold mine or scope three emissions were suddenly considered in environmental assessments, which is being spoke about, could the net negative or theoretically net negative carbon emissions for mining tellurium for solar panels actually offset some of this, making tellurium attractive to, to get out of your gold mine? And I actually really love the idea of this chapter. And um, it's, it's very different to what I have been doing and usually do. Um, but it's really allowed me to consider the whole value of a deposit and think about potential to actually really benefit companies um, that, that look at these deposits. And, um, you know, I massively enjoy being in labs, but um, I wanted to do this PhD because it combined my, my lab work and geochem with my genuine ambition to, to make the world better or greener and all that, um, you know, with the applications to solar energy. Um, and LCA was, was totally new to me and the change has taught me a massive lesson in just asking for help. So it was recommended that I read a specific thesis um, as it's all on, on LCA, but actually someone set me up with a meeting with this guy and I got so much more out of that. And it's really shown the power of you know, talking to people um, and, how, and how often people are willing to help actually. And it's also really highlighted the need for the well-rounded geoscientists, which is quite ironic as the number of students taking up, certainly in the UK, is really dropping. Um, and actually, it's this need for geoscientists to understand hard science as well as global issues that, that led me um, to do some of the other things I do and dabble in when I'm not PhD. Um, so as part of my funding, I have to do a two-week internship. And it has to be entirely separate and unrelated to my PhD. So I couldn't be looking at a gold mine um, or anything like that. And after chasing around some big, big corporates and getting upset and frustrated at the bureaucracy surrounding them, um, I kind of fell on my feet a little bit. I managed to get one with a company called Zotala. Um, so I've been able to focus a little bit more on ESG, so environmental social governance, a side of mining that's allowed me to think um, a bit more about the wider issues. Um, but then COVID hit <laughs> again. Well, not again, but, you know, impacting it again. Um, so there was some talks about what I could do with them remotely. 
Um, and we decided to hold a conference around responsible raw materials. So basically a conference that, that covered all aspects of raw materials, mining, production, end users, bringing everyone together. Um, and we ran this over the course of a week and recorded all the talks and put them online. And the website we've made now has loads of stuff on there. We've got learning materials, um, over 60 talks that we keep adding to, useful links, upcoming events, and loads of stuff going on there. And because of all this, we've recently got involved with the Critical Metals Association, which is involved with Parliament within the UK, um, and are beginning to organise a, a, a conference on artisan and small scale mining as well. Um, and we're in the process of turning it into a charity, which is very exciting. Um, and I also do a little bit of, of paid work as a research associate for them as well on weekends, because, you know, PhD salaries and stuff. Um, I think my point here is that geoscientists are needed and they will increasingly be needed for a more diverse range of jobs. Um, so getting wider experience, it might be different to what you plan and, and not thinking that you need to go for these great flashing internships that are super competitive. You get out of things what you put in and plans evolve and change and sometimes bigger positives come out of it than, than you imagine will. Um, and finally, a little bit about the importance of outreach and psychom. Um, as real global issues come up, like what I've spoke about, there is a real need for people who have the hard science background and knowledge and understanding of things like geochemistry or geophysics or, or whatever it is you do within, within mineral deposit studies, um, to sit behind issues like climate change and problems in mining, but they also have the ability to discuss and address this with a wider audience rather than just you know, amongst ourselves. And I think PhD students often don't get the chance to practice these soft skills so I've really tried to do as much as I can in terms of, of reaching out and doing more than just my hard science. Um, so as well as the responsible materials um, stuff and trying to address these issues in mining, I try to be quite active in terms of addressing other issues like education. And not just because I enjoy it or it benefits me, but because I do think it's really important. Um, so this is me doing something, um, it's called Girls into Geoscience. So these are uh, 13 year olds. Um, and I also co-organised the conference PhD students, which involved um, a talk from Chris Jackson, so one of uh, the only black um, professors in geology within the UK, and Jess Wade, who has uploaded, I think, 9,000 articles to Wikipedia about underrepresented scientists. Um, just, you know, to, to really get down to why science communication is important. And at the end of all that, I think what I'm trying to say is, um, I've done things and met people through this PhD, that had I just stuck to the plan and my research, I would never have done or met. Um, and those and those things actually, I think at the end of it all, make me better at my science, also better at and make my science um, more worthwhile. So I realised that was a real a real um, run through um, my project and and everything else. But um, I thought it'd be nice if we could have more of a conversation at the end of it. Um, so yeah, if anyone has any questions. All right, thank you so much, Rose. Uh, that was fantastic. Um, so yeah, if um, anybody has questions, just go ahead and unmute your mic and go for it. Well, I do have a question. Um, so I, I, th I think I just kind of missed it. Um, when you were talking about the tellurium in your, uh, I think it was your unaltered host rocks, yeah. um what technique was that and can you talk about that a little bit right so ifs it's it oh, let me try and find it uh, yeah. there we go so it's atomic fluorescent spectrometry um oh, okay. which, yeah which if i don't know if you if you know much about it um but basically um you do a dissolution similar as you would do for um icpms um, okay. or anything like that and you um, evapor uh, evaporate or, or atomize your sample um, and then you you bring it to a higher energy state with a cathode lamp which is specific for each element so you can only analyze one element one element at a time um, and yeah it's it theoretically should measure tellurium down to parts per trillion which sounds fantastic mm. um, but in theory it just I don't know if it's because, so I'm the first person to use the instrument at Leicester and they are notoriously okay. difficult to use. Um, but there's <laughs> no set method for measuring tellurium in rocks. So there's a method for tellurium in water and there's a method for selenium in rocks, but not tellurium. 
Um, so there's been a lot of, of playing. So if you can see this, I've actually got like a massive error bar um, on it. <laughs> it's not mm -hmm. great. So they were measured at parts per billion. Um, and I just, uh, the, the graphs are in parts per million because I think people are more um, used to that. Um, yeah. But you can see that, you know, all these subduction samples are all plotted at zero because they were below detection, whereas lots of the, the post-subduction shoshonites fall above. And these are the magmatic rocks. These are the, the non-mineralized ones. So this is nothing to do with mineralization, just where these rocks came through or went through mm -hmm. holds the tellurium. Right. I see. Okay. Very cool. Um, and I do have one more while... Wow. If anybody else is, has a question, they can think about it. Um, so you're you're talking about obviously uh, extracting clarium from these like these gold deposits instead of just from uh, copper porphyries, which are in the past you know several years. That's traditionally what uh, where we get most of our tellurium. Um, do you know and can you talk about the differences in the techniques? Um, because obviously it's going to be slightly different in a, a copper porphyry versus these. Uh, alkaline hosted gold deposits. So can you talk about the differences between those techniques and how uh, effective th those are between the two different types of deposits? Yeah, so so basically most, most fluorium at the minute comes from copper uh, processing, but indirectly. So from the anode slimes, so you have your copper, you mine it, you send it off to, to the refinery. And the anode slimes, loads of, of byproduct metals kind of form in these sludges. Um, and then they do electro spinning on it and get the, the byproducts out. But these systems are very much set up to enhance recovery of silver and PGEs, obviously because mm -hmm. they're far more economically valuable. You know, if you've got right. a, an option between selling tellurium or silver, you're going to sell silver. Um, so the tellurium that comes from it is, is kind of more of a, a happy coincidence, um, <laughs> which, yeah. yeah. Um, in, in the gold telluride deposits, so in Fiji, when Batacola did it, the gold actually forms in the tellurides. So you can do it much more directly at the mine site, perhaps. Um, there's, there's theoretically less, less stages in it. Um, it's difficult because I don't do it many places. So the, the LCA um, study that I'm doing is it's tricky because you have to rely on, on companies being honest, but more companies <laughs> and mining companies that, that mine gold are going into tellurium production. So there's, there's a couple of gold mines in, in British Columbia that are starting to, to advertise themselves as green mines because they're, they're collecting the tellurium there. Um, okay. And there's, there's a mine um, in Sweden, which um, does the same and actually advertised itself as a tellurium mine. It's actually a gold mine, but they really right. hammer home on the, the tellurium aspect um, just because it's, you know, with people like Extinction Rebellion and, and millennials that care, <laughs> it's a much more attractive brand to put onto your, to your mine, especially if it's a new mine. <clears throat> right. That makes sense. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, any other questions for Rose before we let her go? Hey, can, can you hear me? My yeah. mic? Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks. Um, I had a quick question. I came in kind of late. Sorry, but I don't know if you already answered this. Um, do you know how the modal abundance of each of these telluride minerals can affect uh, the recovery rates for tellurium? Does it? Have you looked at that? Does that depend at all on the on the telluride mineralogy? Yeah. Uh, so I haven't looked at this. So I don't know what point you came in. I'm still working on the mineralogy of, of Tavatu. Um, different gold telluride deposits have have, have very different um, abundances. So Vatacola has massive amounts of gold in tellurides, whereas Tavatu has more native gold. Um, so it might just be that this isn't as, as attractive for, for certain mines. I imagine if you have more gold in the tellurides, it's far more attractive. At Tavatu, from what I've seen so far, a lot of the tellurium is hosted within pyrite. Um, that's obviously harder to break down and is less attractive to mine as well because you've got to you've got to play with the pyrite rather than just leaving it be. Um, but if your gold is there, maybe that's attractive and and you need to break it down too. So I think it's very much a a deposit specific question um, that I would like to answer for Tavatu. Um, providing I manage to get in a lab anytime soon. Um, the idea of the LCA is just to show that from a very broad standpoint, 
these deposits do have the potential, although maybe not economically, through other methods of, of, of being a source of tellurium, either if the price of tellurium goes up or if there is introduction of, of carbon levies and, and scope three emissions, things like that. Okay, that's in general. Question. Awesome, thank you. So it uh, looks like Garrett, you have a question if you wanna go ahead with that. Sure. Um, I'm, I'm curious as to the, the last chapter of your, your PhD and how you're planning to, to quantify like the, the economic cost and benefits regarding carbon reductions through the manufacture of solar panels. Like, are, are you planning on using some sort of standard method for converting you know, the amount of tellurium that is mined and uh, yeah, converting I, that over to reduce carbon? Yeah, so, so basically there are there are specific guidelines that you have to follow when you when you do a life cycle analysis. So the standards are set, they're ISO standards, and they are um, global. And you are meant to adhere to them. There are specific ways of doing it. There are also specific databases out there, like um, EcoInvent and things like this, that have standard values for things like um, carbon emissions from specific processing. So there is a value for the emissions that come from producing tellurium as a byproduct of copper that people have already measured. Because these are things that, that companies have to or should be measuring anyway. Um, and there's there's quite a push to, to do these things. Um, with gold mining, it's a bit trickier because obviously every mine, mines tend to be a little bit more different with gold. Um, and obviously, you know, plastic gold deposit is very different to, to this. And there, there gets or there starts to be issues with it, but there are standard values you, you can use. Um, solar, first Solar um, do release data on the emissions from the production of their solar panels and, and their solar panels are cadmium telluride um, solar panels. So you, you can get this data. There starts to be a bit of an art in in working things out energy wise. So when you're talking about carbon levies, at the minute, all I can do is estimate what a carbon levy say might be. And I would have to assume what processes they were going to do to get the tellurium from that specific gold mine. Um, so there are there are quite a lot of assumptions, but they're, they're assumptions that have systems in place to make sure that everybody makes the same assumptions if that makes any sense so because the standards out there it makes it slightly safer and you can also when you're you're running an lca you can there's a method you can use to actually put your probabilities in there so you can say okay actually my error on this value is is this much my error on this is probably this much and you can start to, to factor that out at the end as well so at the end your value that you've got at the end of your process or, or system or product, it can give you a range rather than just saying, okay, it is this. And obviously the better science is, is to do that. Thank you. Any other questions for Rose? You can type them in, in the chat or just go ahead and unmute yourself. It was a real whistle stop tour. I do appreciate the fact I went through a lot very fast. <laughs> yeah, no, it, yeah, it was, yeah, it was a lot to take in, but it was, it was all good, of course. Um, all right. Well, if there's no more questions, um, we'll get a, go ahead and uh, stop the recording. And uh, thank you, Rose, for uh, giving our lunch and learn this week. Thank you for having me.